and welcome to Resilience, the global adaptation podcast, the show where we'll be exploring the best solutions and cutting edge technologies for adapting to climate change. From floating cities to flood resilient farms to forest seawalls, we're coming to you from the UN's Global Adaptation Network. I'm Liz Mullen Bernhardt. And I'm Marcus Neild. In our podcast, we'll be talking to the most renowned adaptation experts, but we'll also be travelling around the world, virtually of course, to meet people and communities on the front lines to learn about how they've built resilience on the ground. We're really excited to share some amazing climate success stories with you. Thanks for being here as we adapt to climate change one conversation at a time. This episode is all about the vital role that nature and ecosystems play in helping us adapt to climate change. Nature is under threat from climate breakdown, but it's also part of the solution. Heat waves have scorched cities this year, but did you know a single tree can provide the same amount of cooling as 10 air conditioning units? And rather than release emissions, trees absorb them. We hear about rising sea levels threatening to wipe whole towns or even islands off the map. And yet, coastal mangroves are extremely effective natural seawalls. In fact, put together, all of the world's mangroves save us from $82 billion a year in damage from flooding. These are what we call nature-based solutions. We're heading to the Seychelles soon to learn more. But first, we had a great conversation with a wetlands ecologist, didn't we, Marcus? Yes, we did. Musonda Mumba, the director for the Rome Centre for Sustainable Development. The Rome Centre is a joint effort by the Government of Italy and our colleagues at the UN Development Programme to focus on the connections between climate change and nature protection. I grew up in the northern region of Zambia, a small town called Mansa, and it's really within the Congo Basin. So we have Democratic Republic of Congo on the border with Zambia. But this particular part of Zambia is also the lake region of the country. So as you can imagine, I'd be visiting all these places with my grandmother, with my dad, my siblings, my mom. In fact, our home was not more than 50 meters away from the river. So my twin sister and I would go swimming in this river with our friends and, and the nearby forest, picking some wild fruit, etc. So for me, it felt very natural just connecting to this space. So that for me was just a really beautiful and amazing foundation. That's awesome. And it reminds me of my grandma's house on the shores of Lake Michigan. I grew up in a big freshwater ecosystem as well. And I love that story. Sounds like the life, to be honest. I have to say I'm slightly jealous of, of both of you. Um, so, Masonda, what excites you most about working in, in adaptation? You know, one time, in fact, I was actually in an airport and then I saw headlines on, I think it was a Newsweek magazine, and it says adapt or die. And it was kind of a, an awakening moment. I was like, oh, my goodness. With the experience that I've had of just working in different communities, working across different countries, speaking to different people and realizing, you know, the changes they've had to make simply because of that zero point something, one degree rise, changes in their local environment. It's been amazing, but also the, the curiosity around what can we do differently and, and also the, the gender dynamic, what are women doing in this space, be it in a city or in a rural setting. And then also at the same time, the hopefulness of these individuals. This is really what kind of like really gets me going every day. And this excites me so much. It really reflects how I feel as well, working in adaptation, especially what you said there about, about the hope. Um, so Nature is often described as a super solution to climate change. Why is that? Do you know what? I mean, we are a part of nature. And, and I think something happened, something over the sort of, you know, hundreds of years, perhaps post-industrial world, something happened and we, we kind of dislodged. I don't know if you remember the movie, you know, Avatar. Um, there's a scene in that Avatar movie where everybody's kind of connected to this tree of life. And when you remove yourself from the tree of life, suddenly you're just incapable of breathing. You know, you get up, you breathe, you breathe in air, breathe it out. The very fact that this air is being cleaned by trees, it's being passed on through your environment. And we're lucky in many ways, especially for us that live in environments that are less polluted. It's all from the natural environment. And at the same time, these are also healing spaces. How can it not be a super space? So one of my personal favorite examples of using nature to adapt to climate change is what's called sponge cities, which I'm sure you obviously know. 
you know, where people bring nature, trees and green spaces into their cities to absorb rainfall and reduce flooding. And then, of course, it also has the benefit of recharging groundwater supplies at the same time. What are some of your personal favourite examples of nature-based solutions for adaptation and why? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Nairobi, where I've, I'd been living for the last 14 years. Um, and in Nairobi, there is the Karura Forest, which obviously was saved by the late Professor Wangari Mathai, the first African woman to have a Nobel Peace Prize. So here is a situation where you have a, a really intact forest ecosystem in a city that not only provides the recharge for the city, but also the cooling of the city. And this has just been, you know, a beautiful place for me. I take my children there for walks. I go running. I meet up with friends. We have conversations. Amazing ideas have popped up in my head just being in this space where, you know, you can hear the birds chirping away and you can see all these, you know, different dynamics, the light and, and sunlight and the rays coming in. So already we see in sort of this sponge system in there um, being incredibly relevant and amazing for us. Unfortunately, not every city is as blessed as Nairobi, which has such an amazing forest right in the middle of it. What an amazing place. Musanda, we all know there have also been some real challenges with nature-based solutions, like trees planted in the wrong soil. What are some of the challenges that you've seen or experienced? Part of my work that I did in the past was also look at invasive species. And as a wetland ecologist, what I found, for instance, in parts of Kenya, parts of different countries within East Africa and Southern Africa, was that there were all these eucalypts. And, you know, eucalyptus is an invasive species, particularly eucalyptus grandis, which comes from Australia. And, and, and it was interesting because, you know, the Ministry of Forestry would give advice to communities to plant it in this location, yada, yada, yada. But what they did not realize, they realized that actually these particular tree species were sucking up the water table very quickly. So even as we talk about restoration, for me, it's, you know, the research has to be right. The knowledge around the type of trees and the tree species has to be right. And communities need to be aware because technically, you know, they do not provide the basis for, you know, a biodiverse landscape should you plant them in an area because it just becomes a monoculture. So this for me has been one of the challenges around, you know, providing sort of nature-based solutions. But also at the same time, I think one of the conversation areas that I had with a lot of many governments around the world was very much this finding the balance, because ultimately you also have to do a sort of a green gray solution. Um, I'll give you a classic case in point. We were discussing with the government of Fiji about doing a seawall. It was, of course, a combination of part of the, the coastal line would have mangroves planted, but another part near the port would need to protect the infrastructure for any, you know, surgeons and seawater infusion, et cetera, and all of that. So for me, it's also finding this balance because we cannot just tell people, no, you can't do that. No, 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 concrete, you cannot even have concrete over there. There has to be a justification why. And I think in my work and in my experience, I found that really insightful because these assessments were very necessary to be able to understand and not make those mistakes that could cause the maladaptation and basically give you all the bad effects that you are not anticipating. Absolutely. That's so essential. Um, I think that it also shows the power of nature, you know, because uh, nature is so powerful that it can actually go wrong. Correct. Absolutely. But it's, it's super important, I think, just to underline the efficacy of nature-based solutions that we need to do it right. All right. So looking forward, what are the three biggest opportunities in nature-based solutions that you see? I feel like we have to be able to make sure that young people are empowered, women are empowered, communities are empowered, and also the sharing of stories, you know, the power of storytelling, how we communicate our experiences, our lived experiences. I'm sure, I mean, unless you're in Germany, the flooding that happened, these experiences, and it's so sad to watch these dynamics, but how do we understand the preparedness around that. So this, this, the power of storytelling is very, very critical. Your experience and your understanding of what you, how your world is changing. And lastly, but not the least, it's important to communicate the messages right. 
there's been a lot of confusion. For instance, you know, are we using these nature-based solutions or are we using nature this? You know, so so depending on the interpretation, I think the foundations are critical to be able to share, be it with governments, be it with scientists, be it with communities, and also in a language that's accessible. I was telling someone the other day that actually in my language in Bemba, we do not have the word restoration because my language always talks about regeneration. So even as you speak to people, let's encourage them that, you know, having a nature-based solution is really an ultimate act. Let's take care of nature now as is and not want to say, oh yeah, let's just destroy it and then we'll see, we'll, we'll do something a little bit later and then make it recover. When you look at that resolution from the UN General Assembly, the word that came first was conserve because it was conserve and restore where necessary. So in essence, of course, there are spaces around the planet that are very degraded, incredibly degraded. I mean, due to maybe agriculture or mining, even as we're restoring these currently degraded spaces, there is no guarantee that it will come back to what it was. We don't even know the baseline. <laughs> Let's start there. So the issue, therefore, is even in a 1.5 degree world, you could say, oh, I'm actually just going to plant trees here and shrubs, etc." But they could not grow, perhaps. We don't know. And this is where the challenge lies. So hence why that conserving is a very critical element. Forests and trees are... Uh generally the most talked about types of nature-based solutions Uh, but my UNEP colleagues uh, well mainly Liz I have to say um, tell me that the conversation around nature-based solutions is too often focused on trees and and sort of neglects the role of of wetlands what's your take on that? I totally agree. You know, I was talking to someone about the Sahel. And of course, there's the amazing Great Green Wall of the Sahel, which is brilliant and amazing. And they were like, oh, you know, the Great Green Wall and the trees. And and I said, hang on, just pause a minute there. The Sahel as an ecosystem is actually a mosaic landscape of which predominantly it's a grassland and shrubland. And also it has one of the world's largest inner water deltas. And I've been to the Niger River Delta. It's spectacular. You can see this delta from space. And it's a beautiful wetland ecosystem. And in the middle of this massive dry land flows the Niger River. So for me, even as we talk about restoration, it's talking about the landscape you know, the different ecosystems. And wetlands are so, so incredible and important. In fact, wetlands have been referred to as the lungs of the earth because wetlands are the very good indicators in terms of, okay, how is the recharge happening for the river? Are you getting the right water supply? Is it clean enough? But also, is there a possibility that this river could dry? And even that level of degradation in a forest will have implications on a wetland ecosystem. And so it cannot just be about trees, 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 trees. Yes, a lot of people see more trees than they would see insects even or worms. But all of this is connected. All of it is interconnected. Misanda, it's great to hear you raise the flag for wetlands. I know that you're a fellow water person, so you're you're a person after my own heart. Uh, You just mentioned the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and it's got a very ambitious goal to trigger a global movement for restoring the world's ecosystems, not just for nature's sake, but for also for the benefit of people. I guess the question we would have for you is, what role can the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration play in helping us adapt to climate change? You know what, Liz? The fact that this was passed as a UN General Assembly resolution was a massive milestone, massive milestone. Within the conversation of this decade, you realize that from that resolution, there's the discussion around the Rio Conventions, the Rio Convention on Biodiversity, Convention on Climate Change, and Convention on Land, um, really all three talk about why restoration matters. I think this decade provides an opportunity, back again to the example that I gave from the Sahel, of the importance of connectivity and the importance of adaptation. We cannot, and I repeat this, we cannot assume that with the changes on the planet and we are living through a planetary emergency, we cannot afford to be sloppy. We cannot afford to even imagine that we can just leave business as usual. I think right now, the fact that we're seeing fires in Sardinia here in Italy, where I am, we're seeing fires in Russia, fires in the US, fires in Canada. I mean, 
this is unprecedented. How do we then adapt to these changes that are happening so fast that are so, so daunting in many ways? I think this is also where back to the issue of agency. We're seeing a lot more youth voices at the table with young people challenging older generations and saying, we need to do something. We need to you know, change our response to these issues. We need to, to stop dealing with the sort of fossil fuels. How do we phase out all of that so that we can be able to adapt better and also just reduce the warming on the planet. We're beginning to see these conversations happening. And then lastly, us here at the Rome Center, we've been supporting the G20 presidency. And just recently, they had the Environment Deputy Ministers meeting where they had the Climate Change and Energy Conference and Summit here. And the ministers are now calling out for more investments in renewable energies. We cannot afford not to do something. The time has run out. We cannot even say time is running out. It has run out. So the turning point is now. Back to that magazine headline, you either adapt or die. So let us not relinquish responsibility. And and I think in building agency, but also building hope, we have to remember that we are citizens of this one planet. And really, it's important that you be part of the change, especially being part of the movement on the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Hashtag Generation Restoration. We are the Generation Restoration. So it's quite exciting. What a powerful end. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been so amazing. Well, from Masonda Mumba in Rome, over to the Indian Ocean and the granite island of Praline one of the three main islands of the Seychelles. And the home of a really interesting biologist. Yes, the incredible Victorin Laboudalon. I actually met Victorin in the Seychelles back in 2019, and if you speak to people in the community, you'll discover he's somewhat of a local hero. Victorin's inspired generations of people in his country to plant trees. Also a grandfather, he officially retired 10 years ago, but instead of just putting his feet up and taking a break, he set up an NGO called the Terrestrial Restoration Action Society of the Seychelles, or TRAS, and he's built up an impressive network of tree planting volunteers. When we make the call, we have a lot of participations. Now, I'm uh, quite proud to say that we got a nursery, biggest nursery for tree planting in Seychelles. Now we have above uh, 20,000 trees is already ready to, for planting. That's so impressive. And I understand Victorin and the volunteers have planted 15,000 trees a year over the last decade. Stunning, right? I also discovered that Victorin has even received national awards for his conservation work. It turns out there's even a local species of fern named after him. Pizzana labudaloniana. Is an endemic uh, species to the Seychelles. That's so cool. And you know, Liz, even his last name, La Boudalon, is unique. La Boudalon is mud friend, planting uh, the mangrove in the mud. Friend of the mud. I like that. Friend of the mud. It's lovely, isn't it? Well, hold on to that image of Victor in, in the mud, planting mangroves. We'll come back to that in a moment. But first, why the need for an organization like Tras in the first place? Praline is a place that they burn all the years. Uh, I think they get uh, three or four bushfires. For example, the introduced species like cinnamon, as soon as the fire touch with the leaves, they burn uh, rapidly because uh, they can move uh, with uh, wind. They can move quite very quickly. When we met in the Seychelles a few years ago now, you showed me around your own tree nursery and you explained to me how different types of trees offer different services when adapting to climate change. Are there any trees that you can plant as a solution for wildfire? They got one they call Tabebuya Balida. It's a tree that they containing about 60% of water in the leaves. They do not burn quickly. They must hit before they burn. Even they got some endemic trees uh, we can grow that they can not burn as soon as they have fire. So could you tell us a little bit about the adaptation work that, that you and uh, the Trust Trust have been doing? We try to make our best to cover the islands of Praline to stop the land degradation. If you see, they got some areas, they got land degradation. The other area is quite green. 
Because if he's on a state land, as soon as they got a fire, the next year is coming, the government make effort to plant. But on the private property, they just let it be. Because uh, we do not have a law that is said, okay, one year, two years, your place was bad, you must plant. Or you go, can contact trust and we can make arrangement and get sponsor. And if you go from the east to the north, you will see on the top of the ridge of the mountain was quite, uh, they got nothing. They got just a small bush and they got a soil erosion. With a climate change, it's good to starting to replant trees on the mountain to stop the land degradations. Because uh, in the time that we got bushfire, when it's raining, they take all the ashes, all the dust, they bring it to the river. In the river, if you do not have mangrove to use like a strainer to stop all the debris to go out at sea, everything wash away and go to sit on the surface of, of the reef. But that is the way where when the sun shines, the coral do not get light and they kill all the corals surrounding. It's tragic to think of corals dying out. But I love Victorin's description of the mangroves protecting both land and oceans. They act as a kind of strainer to stop the sediment before it's washed out to sea. Pretty cool. Let's hear more from Victorin about how mangroves protect us. Yes, if you have mangrove was growing in the coastal area, even they got a, a tsunami, you will see they do not disturb anything. Some species of mangrove, they can grow out at sea. Let's say about 20 meters out in the sea. For example, in 1770, when those people arrived uh, to starting to live on Mahe, they can't manage to go to Mahe because they got so many mangroves, they cover all the bay. Even you do not see a lot of mangrove in Victoria in these days. In the past, they used to have uh, a lot of mangrove growing. So let's say tomorrow, all the mangroves in the Seychelles disappear. What would happen? First thing, you do not have fish gone, crab gone. And you know that you do not have a nursery to nest the small fish. If you lost the mangroves, Seychelles definitively, they, they got no, any other plants can repair this damage that the climate change, you better have the mangrove to do this job. The mangrove is uh, number one for protection of the coastal. That is uh, fantastic. That's fascinating then. So you're, so you're not just planting trees to, to tackle against coastal storms and coastal erosion, but also planting trees to, to hold back wildfire. Great. So one final question for you, Victor. What is the one message that you'd like to give to our audience? Okay, I get a lot of knowledge from uh, the Seychelles. And I would like to share that with young generation. Because, for example, the person Armstrong that they managed to go on the moon is not him who's starting to take a rocket to go on the moon. They got people before that. I try to make sure what I got and I share it with uh, the new generations before I close my eyes. Those are such inspiring stories there from Victorin Laboudelin in the Seychelles and also Musanda Mumba in Rome. In our show notes, you can find links to their work, the Trast Trust and the Rome Center for Sustainable Development. Well, Marcus, that's it for the series. It is indeed. What a journey. I've loved hearing such optimism and so many great examples of solutions, especially from young people, of how we can help societies thrive and even have fun in a world dealing with climate change. Cooking classes, Minecraft games, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And hasn't it been great to hear these personal adaptation stories from each part of the world? We've seen the real transformation in people's lives from danger to resilience. I have to say, I will always remember Madame Cissé on her motorbike with a megaphone in one hand and her sheer determination to spread early warnings to save lives. Adaptation personified. This has been Resilience. Keep adapting. 
Please give us a shout out and share the series or any episodes that really resonated with you. We're Liz Mullen Bernhardt and Marcus Neild, and you can find out more about our organisation, the UN Global Adaptation Network, in the show notes. Penny Dale is the producer. 